welcome to tonight's event um, that has been put together by London CND and Youth and Students CND. Um, it's wonderful to see you all here tonight. And yeah, welcome. We're going to have a great time. Um, so before we get started, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Melina Villanev. I am your host for this evening, and um, I'm actually the uh, co-founder and research director of Demilitarize Education, which is a community for modern day peacemakers uh, working to dismantle the links that exist between the global arms trade and universities. Um, because, yeah, you can never start too early, you know, let's get started. Um, when Julie asked if I would host tonight's event, I was very excited because I don't think people talk about just how important music and activism are for each other and like through the ages they've completely helped to shape one another and helped each other move along um there's been countless singers and songwriters and artists who have highlighted various so social societal and global issues throughout the ages and cnd as we know has notoriously taken up a presence at glastonbury festival for many years um and it, they would still be there this year if it weren't for our global situation that we're all facing at the moment um but really at the heart of both music and activism is the act of um rallying people together right and in times like we are going through today our mutual support is more than ever necessary i hope i said that right i don't know i'm french i'm sorry um back in march boris johnson announced that the cap on nuclear uh, warheads was getting lifted increasing the uk's nuclear arsenal by 40 percent this increased limit is now basically going from 180 to 260 warheads, which by the way, like those 180 bombs, each are eight times more powerful than the little boy, which was dropped on Hiroshima. So at already 180 bombs, the UK's current arsenal is capable of generating um, 1,440 Hiroshimas. And yet, apparently, the sound thing to do here is to increase the cap by 40%. It's maddening. Um, this information was released in a leaked copy of the Integrated Review of Defense and Foreign Policy, where they basically warned that the realistic possibility, you know, uh, uh, that, that a terrorist group will successfully launch a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear attack by 2030. You know, from a globe, from an international perspective, what's the point of signing a non-proliferation treaty if you're then going to proliferate your nuclear weapons? It makes absolutely no sense. And I'm not going to sit here tonight and try to sugarcoat anything. You know, when these things happen, we all feel a sense of, of despair and maybe dread even. You know, how can we keep going with our pleas for justice and our pleas for humanity and, and, and for peace when they're just being ignored? Um, and especially, you know, for communities of color whose homes and lands have often been mining sites for both nuclear proliferation and civilian nuclear use, it's particularly frustrating. Uh, I think most particularly about the uh, radiation monitoring project called Diné No Nukes in uh, Arizona that calls out the issues almost on a daily basis of how the lives of the Navajo Nation are being continuously undermined as mining projects take precedence over the health of their communities. When we have this like sense of dread and this fear and everything, and we're faced with such realizations, the very natural primal thing to do is to release this energy and tension. And this is when something like music comes into play. And we are able to actually release this tension and release this energy and express ourselves. Um, powerful rhythms galvanize our collective spirit and, and powerful lyrics can make us think critically about the world that we live in. Um, Tonight we'll be, you know, discussing music and, and that, that has come out from the previous century, but I think even now we do still see uh, a few of conscious rappers, shall we say, that are coming forward and are kind of calling out issues that aren't being addressed um, and that are unknown really to like mine and Julie's generations. Sorry, there's a lot of people on my screen. Um, so I'm trying to just keep it short. But yeah, so basically the youth is needed now more than ever. Music is also needed now more than ever in order to rally everyone and get everyone all together. Um, because I mean, no one can do this by themselves. And um, where there are people, there is power. Tonight, we're hearing from an incredible panel of speakers, musicians, and activists. I feel incredibly humbled and honored, honestly, to take a seat on this virtual stage. Um, and we hope mostly that this session will revive the anti-nuclear spirit of past decades and energize people to get involved in resisting the government's genocidal measures now. 
Um, all of our speakers tonight, aside from George, began their involvement in the anti-nuclear movement around the same time. Uh, with that being said, what's particularly interesting to note is that they've not all taken the same political roots. So some may come from a religious angle, from a feminist angle, from a more anarchist angle. And consequently, there's very different musical outlays as well, from samba to jazz to folk to chants to anarcho-punk, which I'm so excited to hear about. Um, but yeah, that's enough from me. I'm a bit out of breath, not gonna lie. Um, we're first going to be hearing from George McKay, who is a professor of media studies at the University of East Anglia. Amongst his books are Senseless Acts of Beauty, Cultures of Resistance six, Since the 60s, Glastonbury, A Very English Fair, Shaking All Over, Popular Music and Disability, um, as well as the 32 chapter, The Oxford Handbook of Punk Rock, which he is co-editing with Gina Arnold and is published in 2021, so this year. Um, I know some of you are probably frantically writing his name down to look him up and his works later on, but fear not, there will be a link to his website that comes up in the chat, where he has also made a few of his publications available for free. Um, and yeah, we start with George. We start yeah, with George. can you tell us about all the master and George? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, so, yeah, I'm George Mackay from the University of East Anglia in Norwich. And uh, for about the last 30 odd years, I have been researching, writing about peace cultures, primarily music focused ones, but not exclusively. I've written about, um, I wrote a book called Radical Gardening a few years ago about politics and gardens. And that has an entire section on the peace garden movement of the early 1980s and architects for peace and the relationship between floriculture and pacifism. And um, so, you know, I've kind of extended things out slightly, but in my writings about peace and music, my work goes back to the 1950s, and this surprised me rather when I started. You know, I was working on festivals, pop festivals, and I thought they were a thing of the 60s. And then when I dug in more detail, I found that really the 1950s in Britain is a key decade. Obviously, 1951 is the national, the festival of Britain, the sort of post-war resurgence and revival of official British national culture, but also... 1955, uh, the first um, Sidma Folk Festival. 1955, the first Soho Fair in London. So good, said Jeff Nuttall, that it had to be banned. 1956, the first Bewley Jazz Festival, a national jazz festival in the UK. 1959, the beginning of the Notting Hill, what will become the Notting Hill Carnival, with the Caribbean Festival Carnival at um, St Pancras Hall, organised by Claudia Jones et al. And then, of course, also in amongst this, 1958, it's not really a festival. It's the Aldermaston March from London to Aldermaston, the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment Centre there in Berkshire over three days over Easter. But David Widgery said of the Aldermaston March, which was grouped with lots and lots of young idealist activist people and um, who were marching along, stopping and sleeping overnight in various ad hoc places, church halls, village halls, <laughs> camping outside, and all the time, all along the sides of the roads and marching with people as well, there would be music accompanying things. And so David Widgery, the great writer about left-wing um, cultures in Britain, um, he called, he, he acknowledged Aldermaston as like a proto-pop festival before its time. And, uh, and you can see in some of the images of that, that first march and subsequent Aldermastons, a kind of sense of that youth, landscape, music, idealism, protest, all coming together and marching through and claiming and seeking to reconstruct, change a version of green England. OK, so um, and when I was doing this work, I started thinking this led to my book called Circular Breathing, the Cultural Politics of Jazz in Britain. I started thinking about the curious conjuncture of a New Orleans style parade band, a traditional jazz band playing Oh When the Saints go marching in, etc, etc, et, cetera, et cetera, at the head of an Aldermaston march. Quite a lot of people involved in CMD at the time were left wing. There was a strong anti-Americanism within the Communist Party and lots of strands of left wing politics at the time. And yet one of the chosen soundtracks to this new insurrection, if we can think of it like that, was an American form an avowedly American form of music. And so I started thinking about 
New Orleans parade bands and uh, particularly about the um, very stubborn attitudinal figure of Ken Collier and his, he was a trumpet player, cornetist actually, and his um, Omega Brass Band from, formed in 1955. They were the first real uniformed band. They looked, they had hats, they had white shirts, they had dark trousers, they marched and stepped in time to the music. They were as authentic as it could get, right, for a bunch of white guys from England doing a version of African-American already retrospective culture. And yet it meant something politically. And uh, Aldermaston in the Aldermaston marches, they would often be headed, set off, or at the, in the very first one, brought into London at the end of it by the Omega Brass Band. And there's this sense of... Um, trad jazz and marching bands being there at the start of the scene, at the start of the protest, at the start of the music and politics relationship. And I was really um, intrigued by this. And in fact, David Bolton, who wrote a surprisingly good early book called The History of Jazz in Britain, was also, I think, involved in CMD in its early days. Um, he talked about the New Orleans parade bands on left wing and CMD marches as the beginnings of a leftist marching music of the streets. A leftist marching music of the streets. And I thought this was such a sort of wonderful quotation, you know? And um, it really spoke to me about the relationship between music, the possibilities of music, music claiming the space, resounding the public space, music sounding out saying, here we are, come to us, there's something happening and uh, drawing the attention of everyone so that everyone else can see the demonstration and start to think about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and leading and inspiring and being part of the pleasureful, the pleasureful aspect of youth politics at the time. And um, this seemed to me a really important uh, sort of element of things. And my final point, have I got time to say this final one, Malene? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My final thing really is to reference the writer Jeff Nuttall, who wrote a wonderful book in 1968 called Bomb Culture. Um, right, I, I know Jeff Nuttall was a sort of, you know, a kind of awkward attitudinal character. And, and, and um, um, but, you know, that's part of the thing that goes with making innovative sort of things happen at certain moments. But his book, Bomb Culture from 1968, I would highly recommend it to anyone because Nuttall captures a sense of the existential crisis and also the possibility of culture, especially music, and especially for him as well, a very informal, um, raucous, marching jazz music that he played with what he called the Aldermaston Jazz Band and Nuttall's band um, in the late 50s, 10 years before he's writing Bomb Culture, Nuttall's band in the late 50s, they weren't professional like Collier's Omega Brass Band. They weren't looking good and trying to be authentic. They were raucous, outrageous. They sought to defamiliarize and subvert Land of Hope and Glory, for example, by deliberately playing out of tune and out of time. And so you can see in that a certain musical politics and um, attitude and a, a certain sense of the way in which you could resound even what it meant to be English or British through the way you played a certain repertoire. That was so insightful. And I kind of feel like you see that as well now with like, I don't know, my only reference to music nowadays is rap. And some rappers are just completely coming out of left field and redefining what rap is also through the kind of things that they discuss. So I, that was, yeah, thank you, George. Um, we're gonna go to our next speaker who is Will Embliss, who co-founded the Fallout Marching Band while studying musical instrument making in London. Um, an intense few years followed playing at hundreds of peace events and on several long distance peace marches in the UK and in Europe. And with other Fallout members, he formed Crocodile Style, Bollywood Brass Band and Zubop, fun to say, and toured the UK and Europe for many years and also worked composing music for dance and theater companies. 12 years ago, he stopped touring work and trained as a cycling instructor. And to this day, it's him making the musical installations and tuned percussion instruments and lead instrument making workshops in schools. Will, take it away. Thank you for that introduction. It was very interesting to hear from George about the Aldermaston March, because when I was four years old, I was taken on a day of the Aldermaston March with my brother. And I thought everybody was shouting bang the bomb, which I really enjoyed at the time um, as a four year old. But um, 
yeah, growing up with socialist parents who really had pe good peaceful attitudes. My mother was donating blood to the Viet Cong during the Vietnamese War. She volunteered in the CND office with Bruce um, through a lot of the 80s. Um, and but I had a fear in me about these bombs, about the nuclear reactors that we were building and things. And one day a friend was saying to me, I want to build big structures, powerful images to take on demos because just people walking along isn't enough. And I said, well, more than images, we need the music. So you make the images and we'll get a band together and we'll have a band with the images. And uh, together, Jenny and I, sort of started contacting people we knew and I was at the London College of Furniture so many musicians from that came and pre prior to that I'd been playing free improvised music with the London Musicians Collective and I put the word out and to our first rehearsal we had 25 people of all different levels so this was the band ethos in the end that people could play whatever level they could play at if they had an instrument or a drum or something they could join in and we'd up uh, we'd include them we were very inclusive in that way um and we our fir very first gig was when the architectural association in london we found out was um going to do a seminar on how to build a nuclear bunker in your garden and so we demonstrated outside that and uh we wore black plastic bags with the nuclear symbol on it and uh we were in seven national newspapers some of them front page photos so we felt for 12 of us turning up to this first gig and we had maybe five songs that we could play and we might have a chant in between the song we might sing uh, a verse play a verse then that was really worthwhile us turning up there and getting this in the newspapers and so then as soon as we were seen playing, people wanted to join us, more people wanted to join us. Um, and uh, I was squatting at the time and we had great big rooms in Highbury where we could have big rehearsals. And it became a very much trying to be the band that we wanted society to be. So everybody had to have their say in a meeting and things like that. So those could be very long and arduous, but we did sort of get, repeated requests to play at little site CND events or we wanted to play on the big demos. Um, we started face painting and that got us in uh, in in at, in the newspapers as well. Uh, originally it was all CND signs but then one day Stuart shaved his head and he did a just surreal painting all over his face and head and uh, that that then it face paints took off in another way. And we always tried to create our own repertoire, though sometimes we did adapt old songs like uh, H-Bomb's Thunder. We did a version of that. Um, so you can see some of the photos here in The Economist. Great to be on The Economist, Gen Jenny and uh, Marcus. Um, and we, in, we created our own costumes very much at first. Uh, later on, we decided on having black and a colour or black and silver or whatever. This is us in Paris. We went, some of us uh, marched from Copenhagen to Paris, well, from Germany to Paris on that march. And we did other long distance marches as well. And Jenny and I had a system where we would cycle our bikes to carry our instruments. And then we would play for a couple of miles and have people push our bikes while we played. And then uh we would then uh get back on our bikes and get ahead of the march and have a bit of a rest or something or drop to the back um this is louisa on the right who went on to form the pramazons in uh new zealand when she went back there and we found that going on a march and offering something positive something musical we could affect the mood of it. So we didn't just have up numbers. We also had sad numbers. We also had a, a, a tune called The March of Impending Doom, where we all ended up lying on the floor. So we're bringing in theatre into our music and performance. And so this is at Glastonbury. We did a whole theatrical piece, and this is nuclear waste being dumped under the sea um, here. And... Uh, this 
the band went on for maybe four or five years with lots of iterations of it, we could turn up and do a gig if we had four people, if you had a treble, a bass and a drum, we would do the gig. But we might sometimes be 30 people playing and then it was trying to keep together. Um, and we started widening out our approach to not just the nuclear issue, but other world issues that were really important. The songs are about El Salvador and other issues that we're bringing up. Um, and it wasn't just about the bombs, it was also about the nuclear plants. We played outside Sizewell. Um, and one day Jenny and I found ourselves on this march from Cardiff to Greenham Common, not knowing that people were gonna lock themselves to the gates at the other end. Wow. Um, and uh, several others were with us on that day. I think it was a small band though, if I remember correctly. Um, and the fallout marching band did, people went on. It was sort of like a, a, a very fertile creative place. And so people went on to form the Pipeline Theatre, Green Candle Dance mm. Company, the Stilton Ears, Chain mm. Scar Brassica, the Drones, the Dream Engine, Ra Ra Zoo, Dry and Train, Turtle Key Arts. Um, and there were bands in other parts of the UK that mm. um, started joining in in this way and so in Newcastle there was the stumbling band and in Bristol there was the ambling band and on European trips we linked up in Germany with a band called Dicker Luft which is a sort of play on words it's like it's like a heavy air or thick right. air like heavy metal yeah. and another one Lauter Black they were from Bremen and that's sort of like not real brass or something like mm. that and another one e gay black which is sort of a joke on the union name e gay metal but this is e gay black which means brass so right. we made links like that and we did go to europe and we played we we traveled all the way to commiso when they were putting in the nuclear missiles there and played on demonstrations mm. there and so it was a, a very vital creative part of my uh, 20s um, but what is fa fascinating now is we do get back together we still turn up and play with other musicians yeah. who we've met on marches at national demos at small demos and our children are who are musicians are joining in and being part of it which is really really satisfying um, that is so, so, yeah sorry I hate to interrupt but that is just such a I love that because honestly it's as much as even watching you recall, you know, those memories and just how you were talking about it, although you brought it, although this was brought up about, you know, because of a real fear for life and humanity, you yeah. still look back on it and it you can you can sense that it's like it it was a time that was formative for you and for everyone around you and that it it ultimately created this bond and and I don't even want to say brotherhood because you know I'm I'm not down with the patriarchy, but like yeah. brother brotherhood and sisterhood family. in both senses. Um, a, a family. family, yeah, yeah. No, that was great. Thank you so much, um, George and Will, for sharing. And and I'm. I'm I just, have... I'd just like to say that there was a, mm -hmm. a woman writer, and I can't remember her name, and that she said, "If it's not my, it's if I can't dance to it, it's not my revolution." That is the best quote. I, think I can't I've remember who the person is. <laughs> But yeah, that's wow. the spirit. That yeah. that is that is the spirit. Oh, wasn't that Emma Goldman? Emma Goldman. Say again. Emma, Emma Goldman. Goldman. Yeah, Emma Goldman. Remember. That's the one. Emma mm -hmm. Goldman. Nice. Yeah. Great. Well, thank thank you so much. Oh Pleasure. well, I it's, psh, swiftly moving on to this incredible panel. Um, on this incredible panel, we now um will be hearing from Bruce Kent. Um, for those of you who know CND quite well, you will recognize this name and this face as he is the former chair of CND. Bruce's personal introduction to war and militarism came with his conscription into the British Army in 1947. And his start with the peace world came later through Pax Christi, um, with which he got involved in 1959. And then came Christian CND and so on into CND and the peace world in general. 
Uh, he recently retired as president of the movement for the abolition of war, and he believes that we humans are perfectly capable of building a world in which killing others solves no disputes, um, but only sows the seeds for yet more of them. So I have only one question, um, and that is just, first of all, how are you? But also, how did CND and Glastonbury's relationship start? Because I've always wondered this question, and there's no better person to ask than the former chair. <laughs> Oh, can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Um, yes. There's no problem about the connection with Glastonbury because I had just become the general secretary or something of CND and I was incredibly busy. I was out every night talking somewhere in a church hall or to a trade union or every single night. And so the, the idea of spare time when I could devote myself to other interests really wasn't there. But I got this message from this chap called Michael Evis from down in Glastonbury and, uh, and he'd like to talk to me about music. Well, I know nothing about music. My mother used to send me for piano lessons, but that's as far as I ever went with music. Um, and so this Michael Evis turned up one day and I discovered that he was running, uh, not festivals, but show, sh music shows on his farm. He had a dairy farm and he was running music things in the summer and he wanted CND to be involved. Well, I thought that's a very good idea. What's wrong with that? Let, let's get involved. So I did put my back in it and we had uh, some very successful summers down there in Glastonbury. It's completely astonishing to stand on that stage and look out at 50 or 100,000 people who are all nodding or clapping or something. Quite amazing, which is the experience I had. So I, I knew uh, Glastonbury through Michael Evis, and I was very fond of him and still am, and he's very engaged still. He's, he's mo moved away in a sense from CND, but uh, not completely. He's still quite radical and engaged with all sorts of positive organizations. So that's how I started uh, with any musical connection. Um, uh, but. Um, I wasn't going to talk just about music today, because I think there are things to remember that in those days um, that uh, C&D was on the crest of a wave. People don't realize this, that actually in 1981 to it was the cruise missile time and uh, the whole business of nuclear weapons suddenly took off in ways that we never really understood. But we went from membership of about 15 or 20,000 to membership of over well over 100,000 100, within the matter of 18 months. And that's a fantastic um, operation even to manage, let alone to run effectively. So that was the, what we had to do in CND. We were at the crest of a wave. And I, when I started with CND in the, uh, in the late, late 60s, early 70s, uh, CND was on the way downhill. And it ended up at the end of the 70s before the cruise missile. It was in a very um, low key organization. It wasn't very powerful, but it then took off and we had to catch up with the taking off, which was quite dramatic and quite marvelous. And music, of course, was very much part of it. Wonderfully part of it. All sorts of events took place with music. And, and I being musically illiterate, sat there wondering what the hell was going on. But it was really catching the way music was part of things. But I think we did miss out on a lot of things that we should have done. And that is the whole business of nuclear accidents uh, that, that now people know about, at least they think they know about, that it was hardly ever on the agenda. But we had so many near misses with nuclear weapons that people even now don't really know sufficiently about. And we had great spokesmen like Edward Thompson, uh, who was a historian, excellent historian and a radical man. And he was very much on our side. So uh, we had, we had a, a, a very stimulating time and uh, I don't regret it one minute. I think it was marvelous. And Glastonbury played a very big part in the whole thing. So I shut up now. Is it time for me to shut up? I was told I was only here for a few, a few minutes so you could wave your arms if you want me to shut up, and I will. I, okay, 
it's never shutting up ever because <laughs> that just makes it sound like I'm so po like powerful. No, <laughs> no, thank you so much. I again, I think it's it's as you say. We need to highlight the fact that you know those music is an integral part of of just how you actually get crowds together and how you rally a message and and how you get it um, spread across. And just thank you for, yes, thank you for everything um, and for your testimony today. Um, I have a question for George and yeah. that is, can you give us a brief introduction into what is anarcho-punk? And am I saying that right? <laughs> uh, well, it depends really. I say anarcho-punk, but some people say anarcho-punk. Right, but before that, look at this. This is a um, program from the Glastonbury Festival in 1987. And on the front cover, you can see there, who's that in the middle? Bruce Kent. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and um, I mean, the amazing, thing about, the amazing thing about Glastonbury and, and CND is that it sort of happened really, you know, as a festival, it, it, Glastonbury had taken place on three occasions, a small local event in 1970, the mega free hippie gathering in 71, and then as a loss making event in 1979. So for, you know, a national um, social movement organization to kind of join forces with this festival, which didn't really have a great track record commercially, you know, was actually something of a surprise, I still think. And um, that Glastonbury then sort of really benefited, I think, from CND's national structure, its organization, all the volunteers who were members who would come and work at the festival, so that through the entire 1980s, Mike, uh, Glastonbury was known as the CND Festival, and uh, Michael Evers has said that we raised a million pounds for CND during the decade, you know, so there was fundraising and there's consciousness raising as well from the, um, from the annual summer gathering of music and, and politics at, at, um, in, uh, in Somerset. So uh, round about the same time, a little bit earlier maybe, there's this new scene happening with, um, in a sort of post-punk moment, with a more, um, an, an even more edgy and um, an even more aggressive sounding thing than punk had been. And, um, and also with a more um, radical claim on the possibility of social change and social justice. And, um, and this became known as anarcho-punk, bringing together a serious strand of anarchism with the punk scene to open up a new grassroots movement that sort of spread across the whole of the UK and then internationally as well, and was highly influential. And um, in the late 70s, when it started, the leading band, we could say, of that movement, Crass, who we'll hear from Penny Rambo uh, 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 of Crass in a moment, as uh, the leading band started using as one of their symbols on their flags as they dressed the stage behind them, um, the, the CND logo. And you know, at that time in the late seventies, that wasn't really, that was a bit of a sort of old hippie thing to do, you know, not really associated with the punk scene because as Bruce had said, it wasn't until really 80, 81, you know, 1981, there's the February March from Glatt Cardiff to Greenham Common that Will mentioned. 1981, there's the first Glastonbury CND Festival. But in the late 70s, there was a little bit more reticence, I think, about engaging with CND. <clears throat> and Crass and all the other bands that they encouraged and worked with and uh, made this extraordinary, vibrant, grassroots, underground scene of... Um, autonomous networks of touring, of uh, autonomous labels producing their own music, and um, very uncommercial, very even anti-commercial, you know. So um, I have here one of Crass's um, singles from the time. This is possibly their sort of, um, possibly their strongest anti-nuclear statement. And all the artwork and um, all the, the film and all the music, the lyrics, the recordings, all done in-house from a kind of something of a, a commune organization in Epping Forest. That and is... that is a major, major, I think, cultural achievement. And if we open up this, the record sleeve that I just showed you, there's a huge piece of, well, I've, I've written about this, it's a kind of poster, which is also a tour de force of musical, political propaganda, we can think. Um, about nuclear Britain and laying bare all these settings, all the sites of nuclear weapons and nuclear power and uh, the way in which they worked across Britain. 
wow, and Crass wow. were tremendously influential in um, popularizing that in a perhaps rather neglected uh, strand of society. For 400 March for CND, you're already dead, you're already dead. Penny, I have very many questions to ask, but I, I mean, I, I just, yeah. What, what was the like, I, I wanna ask inspiration, but just how did you make this, this, this track and others, you know? I made that track, we made that track out of absolute rage, um, no other reason. Um, the CND had been sort of um, really attracting attention. Um, the narrative was being broken bit by bit, and lo and behold, the Labour Party decides to join join the game for its own power. And at a big meeting in Hyde Park, I can't remember who it was, some sort of tired old gentleman got on stage and started telling us all about CND and how Labour would sort of support all of these ideas. And I started shouting, fuck off, mate, you're already dead. And other people heard me and it turned into a chant. So that chant was actually, we were all shout, hundreds of us from the grasslands of Hyde Park shouting, you're already dead, you're already dead. One, one other member of the band managed to break into the um, compound at the back of the um, stage and he demobilized the sound. So then they hadn't got anything to say back to us because we'd fucked it up for them because we weren't gonna have that. Um, at that time, we genuinely believed that the peace movement was a powerful force which we were a part of. Um, it was a shared idea, shared impetus, shared rage. And we weren't going to have politicos moving in on that um, to smooth it all over, to iron it out, to make it nice. How did you end up getting involved um, in that case? Um... I got involved in everything because I was born at the, uh, in the same year as Hiroshima. Um, I was introduced to my father when, when I was three, who'd been at war. Um, I looked at books that were in the library, which had the pits of Auschwitz, um, and I didn't like it. Um, I wasn't going to accept this. This was, my father used to tell me it was the real world. Mm. Well, mm. if that was the real world, no. So from the very start, you know, from the age of four or five, I wasn't going to have it. And I never have had it. And I'm still not having it. Um, and I won't accept moderation. I won't accept trying to make things nice. I won't accept trying to politicize things. We have to act from the heart, move from the heart and fight from the heart. And given the situation currently, where nuclear is just one tiny little threat within a huge gamut of threats from pandemics, from bio war, which is something we really need to be looking at rather seriously, um, and whether or not of that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it all comes from absolute rage because beneath the rage, there is great beauty, uh, there is great harmony and there is great peace and that's where we belong and we're forced out of this so actually in this country Oxbridge educated psychopaths we're not dealing with politicians we're not dealing with capitalist landlords and overlords these are an enemy and yes. they're psychopathic Johnson's declaration about increasing nuclear um, Arsenal is a, is pure psychopathy. There's no, there's nothing else to be said on the matter. Yeah, you can't yeah. go and knock on number ten and say, "Do you think you could slightly reduce that number, please?" Fuck off. I uh, and yeah, why do we I tolerate think, think it? We, to we tolerate it because we don't allow ourselves to actually feel it. And if we do I, allow ourselves to feel it, we crumple into little shitty piles on the floor until we find the strength to get up and go for it and that's what we've I, got to I, do 
And when yeah. it goes yeah. quiet, it's because we've been moderated. We've been locked down. We've been in lockdown ever since I was born. Oh, here, Let's here. Break My out. God. We're already running um, late behind schedule, but really, I do. I, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but like, again, I, yes, I want to hear more. Well, I will, I'll, I'll go simply with history is not good enough. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, exactly. Um, our next speaker, which I'm very excited to introduce, is Jennifer Perringer, who is a musician from the uh, Greenham Commons and um, also a co-founder of the Fallout Marching Band, if I understood correctly. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to just give you the floor and um, also kind of ask you about how did, how did your connection, how did your involvement start as well within the entire movement, as it were? Uh, wow, thank you. Thank you, Melina. Uh, yeah, well, I, I got to know Will. We were playing some music for some theater and we had done some free improvising together. And then um, we started dating, so we were spending a lot of time together. And then we got the idea to start the band and, and it, uh, it, you know, the rest is history. Uh, I uh, was, uh, so I, my impression was that I was uh, brought here today to talk to you about Greenham, which is a very, very exciting thing for me to share with you. And so I've been trying to organize my thoughts and let me know if so I'm going to share some screens with you to help me organize my thoughts. And uh, so these were my thoughts this morning. Can you see the screen? Yep, I can okay. see it. So I think so, everyone else can. This is what I'm hoping that you're going to get out of today or get out of me telling you about my life story today. I hope will illustrate these points. Um, music's political power, you know, it creates visibility, media attention. It uh, creates unity and strength amongst the protesters and amongst people, especially if you can get everyone singing the same song together which miraculously did really happen at Greenham. People really learned the same repertoire of songs and it gave them a lot of uh, strength and unity. And just, it creates this wonderful uh, joy and fun and creativity in the movement. And uh, it can really inspire people and create storytelling about the issues and about uh, the actions that you get involved in and finally, for me personally, and for a lot of the musicians I know uh, from the file marching band, it has set us on a life path of community engagement, which I think is of great value in and of itself. Uh, so I've just got, I'm going to do a little slideshow for you because that photo speaks its thousand words. There I am with Vicky, who's here. Yay, Vicky, uh, playing accordion in the file marching band. And uh, after after a while, the, the accordions were getting drowned out by uh, the brass instruments. So I started playing saxophone instead. And then we went, we went down to Greenham, the Fallout Band went down to Greenham to play for uh, the women who were arriving to, to protest against the cruise missiles, which were due to be, uh, uh, to be stored at Greenham Common. And I found myself going there more and more because uh, there was this wonderful culture that was evolving at Greenham. The women were very welcoming and there was a real sense of being listened to as a woman and of being taken seriously as a woman, as a, as a political activist being taken seriously. And so there I am in a, in a homemade tent talking with other women and planning an event. And I, I got, oh, this just shows you that I, I got so involved that I lived there for a while. So there are people are writing to me. That's my return address. <laughs> and the first big event I remember helping organize was uh, a, a festival on March 21st, 1982, I think that was. And uh, I was the music organizer. Those, those pictures were drawn by my, my uh, dear friend, Ruth Marshall. And there was, here's the program for that event. You can see the Fallout Marching Band, the Bristol Ambling Band, the Oxford Street Band, and uh, we, were, uh, uh, we gave a conference on how to start your own marching band. And here's the rest of the program. You see Peggy Seeger, Jazeera, Kimball, all the different people who came down to play at that event. And uh, then we talked about direct action. At the end of that event, 
uh, women were planning to blockade the gates. And this is a kind of questionnaire that I sent out to performers uh, organizing the event. And at the event, there were lots of different things happening. There was the new age gate, the religious gate, the artist gate, the music gate, the women's gate, and the green gate. So this was the beginning of things spreading out, not just from one gate, but to all the gates of the base. And uh, here we are getting arrested that day. Uh, very politely, it was the first set of arrests that happened at Greenham Common, and we blockaded the entrance and the policeman very politely uh, arrested us that day. That was the first 35 women. And then this is a photo of the next big event that I remember being involved in, which was on December 12th. It was called Embrace the Base. And uh, at the, by this time, the camp had gone women only. And uh, we created a contingent of the Fallout Marching Band. We called ourselves the Women of Wonga. And Vicky, who's here, thank you, Vicky, helped us make these amazing rainbow hats and outfits, and um, which we very joyfully uh, walked around the perimeter of the base on a very cold, I think, rainy day, and playing music. And uh, here was our, and we handing out our song sheets. And a lot of these songs, the uh, amazing things that a lot of these songs became very central to the the movement and uh, women. Uh, a lot of women learned them, and they were a very important part of actions and events uh, going forward from this time. This was, a, this was a fallout marching band song by Kevin Grant that, that sang about the actions at Greenham. And this was also a, a popular song that we used to sing. That was a fallout marching band song that Will and I wrote about that we would sing down there. And here is the program for that day, December 12th. You can see the the strong female imagery and web image, uh, imagery. We did a lot of weaving webs down there. Uh, the program says, uh, I would like how it introduces itself. It says, we're here to come to terms with this place on our terms, the terms of life. Listen to your feelings, hang banners, spin webs, write messages in the mud, make yourself at home. And the idea was to hold hands around the perimeter of the nine mile base, and we did it. There were some, more than 30,000 women came and we held hands around the base and sang our songs. And uh, they say in the program, there are many things we can do, none are more important than others. Camping on the common, talking to workers, singing, blockading, letting our imagination and humor work. All of those are direct actions. So it was this very inclusive, very invite, inviting sort of culture. And here in the program, you can see singing. There was a schedule for singing. And we have all these songs that we sang. And uh, we then we have a lyric sheet so that we uh, were teaching people how to sing these songs. And that became very important for, for events. So before I take up too much time, I think it's time to sing a song, don't you? Let's sing a song. Um, so I'm going to sing you a, uh, a few songs and actually, you know, join in as you know them. That would be great. I, probably I'm mute because it'll sound like chaos because of the syncing issues, unfortunately. I wish we could really sing together, but here we go. I'll just sing a few. And the first one I'm going to do is chant down Greenham. And it goes like this. 35 women, campers for peace, breaking the law so there'll be no more. We don't want your love, we don't like your cause, we won't fight your war, stand up we die. Okay, that's Chant Down Greenham. And then we have uh, With Our Lovely Feathers, which goes like this. Now, the thing is that these songs are so simple, one or two chords, and I think that was a key to their success because they're so easy to learn. And you can harmonize and you can make rounds on them and you can add wonderful fills. And so they, they offer themselves for creative expansion. 
so here is with our lovely feathers, with our lovely feathers we shall fly. With our lovely feathers we shall fly. We'll circle around, we'll circle around the boundaries of the earth. We'll circle around, we'll circle around the boundaries of the earth. And then we have under very sweet, very kind of universal, uplifting, gentle words. Uh, under the full moonlight, under the full moonlight, we dance. Spirits dance, we dance. Joining hands, we dance. Joining souls, we join. Under the full moonlight, we dance. Spirits dance, we dance. Joining hands, we dance. Joining souls rejoice. And finally, very important song to the movement, You Can't Kill the Spirit. You can't kill the spirit. She is like a mountain. Old and strong. She goes on and on and on. You can't kill the spirit. She is like a mountain, old and strong. She goes on and on and on. Okay, so uh, that's the end of that program. I like the picture of the women at the bottom. And now for my final thing with you here today, I wanted to show you how all the songs I just sang you came into action for actual events. And this event was uh, very early on New Year's Day, 1983. And uh, a group of women went around, including myself and so, some of the other people who are here today. <laughs> uh, we went, we crept through the woods to this spot uh, uh, at the perimeter fence of, of Greenham Common Air Force Base, where they had built silos to store the cruise missiles, which were due to arrive. And the women threw their, some women went inside, threw their carpets over the barbed wire and climbed inside. And some of us stayed outside playing music and singing for them. And for a long time, they were up on the top, dancing in a circle while we were singing and playing. Uh, it was a long time before the police showed up. And I don't think they would have had the energy to have kept dancing and singing in that circle if we hadn't been on the outside of the perimeter fence playing and singing with them. So that was a really powerful experience. And I'm, I'm hoping we can show the video clip of it. Can, can we show it, Julie? So you can hear Chat Down Greenham. There's myself, there's Fionn. You, it's very bad visual, it was dark. Sally, perhaps? You have to go to the link if you want to see the video. They're singing Chant on Greenham. The police have arrived. Now we're doing we're doing under the full moonlight now. And the women have climbed to the top of the silo and they're dancing around the silo. We did a lot of the kind of ululating. This song, I don't know. There are a lot of songs out there. Particularly us, that they're supported in court by women. Now, obviously, there's no way we can stop anybody.
everybody coming in, and you're the ones who are going to choose who comes in. But I just wanted you to know that those were the wishes of the women on trial. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. That's a lot. Good. Here's you can't kill the spirit. And here's with our lovely feathers, jamming on with our lovely flat feathers. <laughs> okay, we can cut it. That that was it. That's what I wanted to show. Thank you. Thank you. That was, I feel like I was there, but I wasn't there, but yeah. I, my spirit was definitely there. <laughs> yeah. um, that is, wow. Yeah, incredible. I mean, thank you so much. Jenny, Bruce, Penny, um, George, but, you know, um, Will, thank you so much for today. And obviously we have run over a bit of time and I don't want to let any questions go unanswered. So we're going to give ourselves like probably an extra 10 minutes. If you can stick around, if not, we understand, but, um, you know, for, for the sake of, of just, yeah, being able to address everything. Um, I guess I have a question overall for like all of our speakers. Um, and I, that would be what kind of advice you would give to, you know, current, like, young activists who are trying to find this way to be able to convey their message in a way where they're not just shut down and told that, like, don't worry about it, it's beyond your control. And, you know, how, how can we really empower the next wave of activists to come through, especially through music, if you have any tips? Um, maybe we can go in order of, uh, like, who spoke, so we can start with George and then Will, Bruce, Penny and then Jenny. Well, OK, um, I just also think that part of it is I know Penn said about um, uh, history isn't enough, but history is part of it. And um, there's a way in which sometimes activists on what we might think of as the left or we might not. But anyway, let's put it there for now. Is, uh, well, sometimes we don't cherish, we don't take care of our own history enough. And then uh, here's a fact, here's a question. If we don't care for it, why should anyone else care? And um, so one of the things that we, we can do, and this is me speaking slightly academically, is make sure that the earlier manifestations and stories and narratives have been told. So even the very fact of gathering these stories and energies this evening, right, speaks about um, sort of inspiration and speaks about possibility and the possible envisioning of a different way of doing things. And then that is inspiring in its own right and so i think that a significant part of it is there's a responsibility on people from previous generations what we never what we should never say is oh we did that right oh we did that didn't work or we did it better or whatever it is that's not the point the point is to say well this is what we tried here is the tradition that if you're part of it or that you can work against and here it is and see what we did and see if you can do it better and uh, come to us with questions as well. So partly there is a sort of an imperative on our part to champion the achievements of past generations and to make sure that those possible there's um, successes as well as the mistakes, the errors, the experiments and so on are passed on as a kind of, you know, a, a sort of a present of knowledge, possibility, and a little bit of kind of um, sustained visionary dreaming and the importance of that too. Thank you, George. Um, Will? Oh, you're on mute, Will. Oh dear. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there, can you hear yes. me? Sorry yes, about okay. that. Um, <laughs> I just, feel like if you if you are a creative person in art or film or poetry or music start doing it join with other people doing it more people will join you you'll get support from your collective and you can do you know it will it will feed 
you back. You, you're putting the energy in, but you'll get the feedback and the love from the people around you, putting the art and the creativity into all these protests. If it's just people going along sort of like sheep on a demo going that, 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 nobody responds to it. People do respond to violence in terms of the, uh, the, the journalists and everything love to show the violence, but the other thing we can show them is the peaceful, mm. creative side that we have and, and showing the world we want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, I, I definitely agree. Um, I'm actually going to ask Bruce the following question, which has been um, posed, which is how can CND link to the energy of Extinction Rebellion and other current movements that have similar concerns? Um, the nuclear threat gets less attention than climate change, but with proliferation, the danger is increasing. I'm not, I'm not sure whether I understood that question. Could you repeat it very briefly? Sure. Basically, how do we make sure that people think of nuclear proliferation as seriously as they think of like climate change and, you know, the dangers that are coming from the impeding dangers that we have with, with that? Well, I think well, one of the critical things we can do is to show these issues are interconnected. There isn't one issue on climate change. There's a whole variety of issues on climate change. I mean, we are supplying Saudi Arabia with bombs and God knows what else, and they're dropping on Yemen, and that's mm -hmm. got something to do with climate change. But we talk about it as if we were working simply on the Hausman's Peace Directory, as if different organizations were all separate. We're all in the same field, but, but mm -hmm. with some of us are specializing on one bit, some on another bit. And I think we, without being hostile to anybody else, we should show that we are cooperating. And climate change is an, an issue which affects us all, and we all cause it. Every time mm -hmm. we light a, light a fire, we're causing climate change. And we've mm -hmm. got to think about how we restrain generally. So inter, interdepartmental discussion, I think, is a critical way forward. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, definitely agree. Um, and I guess the I've got a question as well for Penny and Jenny. I love the rhyming scheme here. Um, but essentially, where do you see most urgency for action now? And are there any musicians you see corresponding with that? So we'll start with Penny and then we'll go to Jenny. I'm at really at a bit of a loss because, I mean, climate change, bio war, nuclear war, gross slavery, gross uh, racial in, uh, indifference, etc, etc, etc. Look at capitalism and overthrow it. There's nothing else to it. I mean, it's, we, we will not change anything mm. with the current mm. governance of the world. Yeah, and we have to look at that. We can't, we, there's no point in really just dancing around hoping someone it's not going to happen mm -hmm. they need to be removed mm -hmm. be that through revolution be it through absolute indifference utter rejection whatever it is the psychopaths have to be removed yeah and and jenny what about yourself well, I can't really give a, a, a playlist or a listening list to you, but uh, I just want to say that um, I think it's really important for uh, us to listen to women, us to listen to uh, black and brown people, and for us to, uh, for, for those people and for all of us to uh, feel, in, feel empowered to speak up, but, uh, and for us to promote especially creative, the creative and political efforts of women and black and brown people. So, yeah. Well, thank you for highlighting that. And um, I, I, yeah, I mean, basically, I wish we had like seven more hours to have this talk because <laughs> I think that there's a number of things that we raised here tonight, which an hour is definitely not going to do justice in terms of like being able to discuss the nuances of it and how we even got here in the first place. Um, I know we had other questions in the chat. I'm, I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, and, you know, I think it's it is just 
as long as we keep in touch with each other, then hopefully we can like answer these questions ourselves through discussion and through cooperation and everything. Um, but I guess we are basically going to close. Um, I, Julie, I don't know if we had time for closing things still or not. What, what were you thinking? I mean, I feel like definitely the, the end point here is that um, it's a struggle that's still very, very painfully relevant and that it's really important to get involved if you can. Uh, youth and Student CND keeps trying to recruit new people. Uh, as you will have seen in the panel, uh, there's kind of like a deficit of young people and we've struggled to have young musicians involved. So we want young musicians, we want young people, people of all ages to get involved, keep producing music keep talking about the horror that our governments are putting everyone through because this risk is not yeah. just towards ourselves it's yeah. it's genocidal weapons so it's still really yeah. really crucial to to struggle and and music will be part of that there's a kill the bill but much uh all across the country i'm sure there will be yeah. musicians who will attend cindy will be there we're also part of that I want to thank um, George Mackay for sharing a list of um, articles that he's written on the topic. So Arno Kapung, he's written about Cindy, about Glastonbury, about street bands and jazz. And so he's compiled all of that as like a free um, access resources. So I'm going to put that in the chat and I've sent that to you by email as well. I, I will resend it. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, I think that I'm hoping everyone thought it was an interesting um, event that you've learned something. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to drop a poll so you can say how you thought the event went and if you want to keep being in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Milina, for hosting. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And thank you to our panelists. It was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.